chosen for our discussion today is close to what you've just said, is <laughs> distinctive and meaningful discourse. Uh, this is a phrase from uh, the five-year plan. Baha'is have a, have a plan every five years given to us by Universal House of Justice, uh, the governing body of Baha'is. So uh, in that message, they tell us that, that we have to have distinctive and meaningful discourse. So what does that mean? In its broader sense, it means that whatever we say, whenever we open our mouth, it has to be meaningful. It has to be respectable. It has to be kind. Right? So in a few words, that's what it means. So, uh, but it's, it's so important, you know. Uh, I'm glad my wife is not here because she would say that, you know, sometimes you have not been <laughs> distinctive and meaningful in what you say. Uh, but uh, we, all, we are imperfect human beings and we make mistakes. But it's always good to come here or to open the holy books and see how we should really be. Because we're all made in the image of God, right? And we want to be like Him. And you must try every day of our lives. So in order to, to make my short speech meaningful, I will begin with a passage from Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. So let's all reverently and very carefully listen to the depth of this message from Baha'u'llah. It is from one of his tablets, the Lohe Maqsud that I'll share with you. He says, every word, every word is endowed with the Spirit. Therefore, the speaker or expounder should carefully deliver his words at the appropriate time and place. For the impression which each word maketh is clearly evident and perceptible. The great being saith, one word may be likened unto fire, another unto light, and the influence that they can exert is manifest in the world. So every word that we utter can be meaningful, can be thoughtful, can be kind, or could be the reverse, right? And we all know that the effect of one or the other, right? One builds, the other one destroys. And we are here to build a new civilization, right? And that civilization that we are hoping to build should be built on kindness and generosity of spirit. And that begins with the spoken word. How we say it, when we say it. 
So he goes on in this tablet and says that with words as mild as milk and with utmost leniency and forbearance so that the sweetness of his word may induce everyone to attain that which benefited mankind. Every word would be saying should be gentle in order to penetrate, right? We have a lot of very distinguished and knowledgeable people in the world. I won't name any names, but they may come to t on TV and they may, or they may record something on YouTube. And even though they're knowledgeable, but it may not be kind the way they say it. Or it may be insulting to the person who's sitting next to them, right? So no matter how knowledgeable they are, it's of no use, right? It's of no use. Our word has to be endowed with meaning. And that meaning should be kind and generous and gentle. So he goes on in saying that, listen to this, not everything that a man knoweth can be disclosed. Nor can everything that he can disclose be regarded as timely. Nor can every timely utterance be considered as suitable to the capacity of those who hear it. Did you all listen to that passage? So, you may know a lot of things, I may know a lot of things, and we are talking to somebody and we have to gauge and measure where that person is coming from, right? And talk to that person based on his or her capacity, understanding, with generosity of spirit. You know, when we go to some place of worship where the preacher is kind and generous, or other places where he shouts, right? He shouts for you to be healed, to be, to be like him, that's not, that's not effective, right? It has to be kind and generous and gentle all the time. So when we go out of here, I hope you remember the best we can, the Word of God, the Word of Baha'u'llah. That in our discourse with our brother or sister, or mother or father, or son or daughter, or our co-worker, or somebody in the street, in the street if you want to build peace, it has to be kind and generous. Otherwise, it will have the opposite effect. And the other message of this last passage that I shared with you is that, is that everything that we say should be measured. Should be measured by the capacity of the audience, right? Otherwise, it won't be effective. I'll share with you one more passage and I'll chat with you a little bit. Baha'u'llah says again in the same tablet, it's called Tablet of Maqsud, Loha Maqsud, in the book called Tablets, page 172, if you want to go back, hopefully you'll go back, page 172 and 73, where he discusses the importance of the gentility of our words and spirit. So Baha'u'llah says, every word is endowed with the spirit. Therefore the speaker or expounder should carefully deliver his words at the appropriate time and place. For the impression which each word maketh is clearly evident and perceptible. The great being saith, one word may be likened unto fire, another unto light, and the influence that they can exert is manifest in the world. That's basically the message. The message of how we say it and when we say it. Some, some of the friends know that in the last couple of years I've had the blessing and the pleasure of associating with different churches and synagogues and mosques in the area. And that has taught me in practice 
what Baha'u'llah had taught me in words. Because he tells us what? He tells us that we should associate with people of all faiths in a spirit of amity and concord. Many times I was invited to speak here or elsewhere, and I just spoke about it. But the last few years, the last two or three years in particular, I have tried to practice it. And that practice is associated with all people in a spirit of amity and concord, which means I have to learn to listen to them, to hear them, to see where they're coming from, and not to impose where I'm coming from. Initially, that was a little challenge, but gradually I learned. And we learned through humbling ourselves, through not considering yourself an inch taller or more or better than another person. To be at the same level, to love them, to love them, to care for them, then you'll begin to be effective. And more than anything, as I was associating, every time I referred back to the talks of Abdul Baha, the eldest son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, who came to this country in 1912, and he gave hundreds of speeches in churches and synagogues in other places, in universities. And when you go back, and please go back and read them over and over again. When you read them, you always see his spirit of gentility, right? Purity, kindness. That's the way we should always be. And so, in my association with these churches and synagogues and mosques, then I became comfortable in asking them to come and talk to me one, 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 one on one, all these pastors and rabbis. And so far this year, I've had the, the pleasure of interviewing, I believe, six of those friends. And my friend Farzad has been kind enough to come and take them. And so I have them all, and I share them with whoever likes to share them. It is on my Facebook page as well. What I found out in this discussion is that we're all trying, right? We're all trying to know God and to worship God and to be one with Him. But we're all at different stages. So I get inspiration from Baha'u'llah's words and I go to them and talk to them the best I can. Again, not exactly from where I'm coming from, but seeing eye to eye and starting a dialogue. So I'm going to share with you a few things that I learned in this discussion. <clears throat> I start with the commonality between me and my background as a Baha'i and all of these friends, whether they're Jews or Christian or Muslim or other faiths. I've not been able to contact yet Buddhists and Hindus, but I'm, I'll be, that's my next project. So. The next level, the first thing. So the, my first question is usually, God. What is your understanding of God? And they say it in their own words. And I share with them Baha'u'llah's words. And I'm going to give you a synopsis, a summary of that discussion. So after they're done, I tell them, Baha'u'llah tells us that God is the unknowable essence. No matter how best we want to define it, we can't really define it with our limited mind, right? And so, no matter what they have said, this is the word of God for this age, right? They understand it. And so far, I think all of them, after the discussion is over, or during the discussion, they confirm it. So I've heard them, I've shared the Word of God based on what we, the dialogue is about and make a conclusion. Then we say because we cannot understand the nature of God, but Baha'u'llah also tells us that God is the embodiment of virtues, right? And we're all made in the image of God. 
And therefore, he tells us, and I said that I, I think you agree with, that, with us, with Baha'u'llah, that we have to embody all these virtues, including what we're talking about, kindness and compassion and generosity. And then in that process, we can become God-like. And so they basically agree. I've been to Episcopal Church, to Methodist Church, to Unity Church, to Unitarian Universalist Church. Who else? Tell me, Farzad. And so on and so forth. And so we come to this point of understanding on what God is. And how Baha'u'llah explains it for today as to what God is. Then the next question is, what is your understanding of religion? Say a few things, that's what we believe, that's the way we are, this, this is what makes us unique and all that. And I conclude with a passage from Baha'u'llah. Religion should be a cause of love and affection. If your church or synagogue and mosque works on creating a community with love and affection, that's exactly where you need to be. But then, if it causes division and animosity, therefore you probably should probably change uh, the format. Who is there to argue with that? Right? Religion should be a cause of love and affection. Otherwise, you're better off without it, right? So we come to an agreement. Next discussion is, what is prophet? What is manifestation of God? And they say from their perspective, you know, uh, Moses is the greatest, the Jews, Jesus is the greatest, Muhammad is the greatest, uh, he's the final one, he's, he's this, he's that. And so they, they say whatever they want to say. And I, and I basically agree with them. Yes, Muhammad is the greatest. Jesus is the greatest. Moses is the greatest. All of them are the greatest. That's good. Then I share Baha'u'llah's perspective. What is Baha'u'llah's perspective? Says, As a Baha'i, they're all our prophets, right? They're all manifested in God. They came from the same source. They said basically the same things to guide us for an ever advancing civilization. So I tell them that in the word of Baha'u'llah, you deny one, you deny them all. So I left behind Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, Baha'u'llah are all one and the same. They came at different times to guide mankind to become better and better. And therefore I said, I cannot deny any one of them. And believe me, all of these friends that I've so far interviewed come to that conclusion as well. Within half hour, one hour discussion. So we come to that conclusion. All of that. And it just goes on. This is the... As, Essence, we, we talk about heaven and hell, we talk about life after death, and all these different issues. And I shared Baha'u'llah's words, which is the same word but renewed for today, right? The same word, but the important thing is to talk from their perspective and guide them to Baha'u'llah's words gradually, one at a time, right? One at a time. Then I asked them, What is your perspective on moral teaching of your religion? And they tell me about justice and compassion and forgiveness and accountability, right? All of those things. And I tell them, that's exactly what I think. Why? Said, so why? What is, uh, what do you mean? Well, Baha'u'llah said also the same thing. Jesus said the same thing. Moses has said the same thing on moral teachings of religion. So, moral teachings of religions. I basically one and the same, right? There could be different words, but they talk about forgiveness, justice, and so on. So the moral teachings of all religions we, we, conclu we conclude together, whether it's a Muslim Imam, or a Jewish Rabbi, or a Christian minister, that moral teaching of all faiths, you open all the books, are essentially one and the same. 
we agree. I've been up to all these ministers. We all come to that in agreement. Then we go to, this, to the next phase. Let's talk about religious laws. What are some of your laws? And they talk about prayers and fasting and inheritance. And the conclusion, wonderful. All the laws of all religions are fundamentally serve the same purpose, although in the practice of it, it's a little different, right? You know, Muslims pray five times a day. Baha'is have different kinds of obligatory prayers. Because, because of our time, we can have the short obligatory prayer, the medium prayer, which we say three times a day, or the long one that we say one time a day, and so on. So, right? so uh, uh, we come to the agreement that the laws of religions are basically in harmony, right? There's not much difference between the laws of religions. Then what do you think the next subtopic of this one hour or two hour discussion is? Then I'm summarizing in a few minutes that I have here. And the last subtopic, or the next to last subtopic, is what about the social laws of religion? And of course they would ask, what do you mean by social laws of religion? And I would say, things like independent search for truth, things like equality between men and women, equality among all races, because we're all children of the same God, harmony of science and religion. I said, so these are the few examples. These are what we call the social teaching of religion. And most of these progressive like called reformed Jews or progressive churches that I've been so far privileged to, to speak with, they would come to the conclusion that yes, I have opened the Bible or the Old Testament or Quran, and there are many passages that can be considered sexist or racist, right? They would, they would tell me before I tell them. But they would say that our church does not do it, or our synagogue doesn't do it, because we understand that the time has changed. And I tell them, wonderful. That's what also Baha'u'llah says. The only difference is that when I do it my way, you do it your way, that church also does it that way, then we have 2,000 denominations, right? Some cases we agree, in some cases we don't agree. Baha'u'llah says this message that I've got is the message from God for this age, which says all the moral teachings are the same. The laws are basically in harmony. These social teachings have to change because times have changed. And he says this is my commandment from God so that you won't have a conservative group who says no, that's not in the Bible, but I don't agree with it. That's not in the Quran. And Quran says the right of women and men are not the same and so on. I don't agree with it. It's from God. He has revised his book, the same book. And therefore, uh, we agree with you, but we said that Baha'u'llah gave it to us. So we come basically to the same, same agreement. And my last question for them. What do you think my last question is? I, I'd ask them, how do you read prophecies? The book of Revelation in the Bible is all prophecies, right? Hundreds of pages. I shall come back. I will return. I will come in the glory of the Father, right? All the holy books that you read. Passage after passage, right? Of the return. What do you think? The, uh, this is the hard one now. The answer that I usually get from these friends is that one of them said it's confusing. It's confusing, we just don't dwell on it. We don't read it. That's what one of them said. It's in the tape, you can see. It's confusing, it's, it's, I don't understand it. 
<laughs> we just dwell, don't dwell on it, we don't even read it. Uh, another one said, these are all stories and parables. You know, I, I told them about the stories and parables of the world was made in six days, which is not true. A woman was made from the rib of Adam, which is not true. And so on. So, uh, so these were stories and parables. So he concludes uh, that these are also stories and parables so that we'll be, so, so, so that we won't be, uh, we, so that we do good. And so we do good and, and be afraid that if we don't do good, then something will happen. Uh, so, then in order not to create controversy, I just tell them for this question, I will tell you, tell you our perspective, but I don't expect an answer. Because Baha'u'llah says that we need to search for ourselves. Baha'is believe that all religions are renewed by God approximately once every a thousand years. And that is the return that Jesus talked about Muhammad talked about, Moses talked about. The problem is that man is resistant to change and we are comfortable where we are in our church or synagogue. Therefore, we don't want to change and we blame it on God. So, well, this is our perspective, but you know, uh, when you're ready to talk about it more, then we'll have another take and we conclude. So this is how we do it. And so let me conclude now. Our discussion was on distinctive and meaningful discussion. Through reading Abu Baha's writings, Baha'u'llah's writings, and practicing in these churches and synagogues, I'm learning what that important passage is that we all need to abide by every time we open our mouth. Distinctive and meaningful discussion. So that the discussion would be uplifting, it won't be hurtful, it would have meaning and it would elevate both of us, both the listener and the speaker. So I conclude with this passage from Universal House of Justice. Uh, and let me also share with you this before I read this passage. Uh, that I went to conference 1971. How many years ago was it? 40 years ago? Over 40 years ago in Africa, in Liberia. Uh, Ruhi Khanum was there. <clears throat> you know Ruhi Khanum? She was the wife of the guardian of the Baha'i faith, who passed away in 1957, and I believe she passed away in 2000, 43 years after the passing of her husband in Haifa, Israel. Uh, and she was there. And she, she was, uh, she joked sometimes, and she, she said, you know, the problem with some of you Baha'is uh, is that you have all these prescriptions of Baha'u'llah, 100 volumes, right? And many of you have read them, or many of you have heard them over and over again in different conferences. And so whenever you have a non-Baha'i or a friend, you dump it all on them. 100 pages of, of, of volumes of books. And he says, Baha'u'llah was the divine physician, but even that, if that divine physician wanted to dump the ball on one person, he would kill him or kill her because it's, it's too much drugs, too much medicine. You have to prescribe it one at a time. So we should be patient with ourselves and also with our non-Baha'i friends and share them one at a time. So if there's any non-Baha'i friend, before we leave, I brought a few copies of a beautiful book that every Baha'i should have. But if, you, if you're a Baha'i, I'll charge you $5. If you're a non-Baha'i, uh, if you don't have, have not declared yet, which is not important, by the way, I'll read it from Universal Justice. I will present it to you. The proofs of Baha'u'llah's mission. Now, with the concluding passage from Universal Justice on the question of distinctive and meaningful conversation. They say, whether the first contact, the contact of the people that we are associating with, Whether their first contact with such newly found friends elicits an invitation for them to enroll in the Baha'i community or to participate in one of his activities is not an overwhelming concern. When we meet somebody, we don't want to convert them, right? It's their job to go and read and decide for themselves. 
the distinctive and meaningful conversation is that we love them all. We want to associate with everyone. And there's something that God has given us, we share them. We don't proselytize. Proselytizing is forbidden in the Bible, faith, right? Forbidden. So he said that it's not our concern, our major concern to convert them or for them to sign a card. That's, that's their concern. That's their activity. And then they say, more important is that every soul feel welcome to join, to join the community in contributing to the betterment of society concerning a path of service to humanity. It's a change in the way we think, right? Our concern should be to invite people to say that you go, you go and help the needy, I'm with you. You want to be a better person, I'm with you. If I can be of help, I'm with you. So that's the path that universal justice in this last five-year plan that ends next year wants from us. First and foremost, we want friendship, we want understanding, we want respectable and kind language. Thank you very much. Thank you.